Hey folks, welcome back to another Sunday preview here at OSL in McKinney, Texas. I'm joined here with Peter Burrow, well-known voice, Peter Burrow, not the apostle, but the uh, OSL's Peter Burrow, and then a brand new voice to the podcast, mm. Tom Taylor. Thanks for joining, wonderful, Tom. Wonderful, wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah, if, you, if you've seen Tom around here, Tom is an elder here at OSL. He's also a guy that does a lot of things to help the church quietly that aren't seen, particularly after late service. Tom is great about going around our campus, turning off lights, picking up trash. He's one of those unsung uh, heroes around here. We're very grateful to have Tom, uh, not only part of OSL, but here on the podcast. So let's not get after all, it. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> all right, let's get after it. So we're going to be in Isaiah 40. This is Isaiah 40 verses 1 through 11. And this section, this, this chapter, the editors have titled it at least initially, comfort for God's people. And you'll hear a little, it's appropriate this reading, you'll hear a little tinge of Christmas in here, um, a verse we're, we're used to hearing around Christmas time. So here's what it says. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her. That her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley, valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry. And I said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. Grass withers, the flower fades. And the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. All right. So this is the end of our gospel, our gospel, our Old Testament text for this coming Sunday. There's a lot in here. There's a bunch of different directions you could take on this. But Peter, give us your initial thoughts on this. Well, um, now, yes, it, it, as the uh, title says, comfort for God's people. Um, but it's interesting in this, in the context, historically, this is actually before they go into exile. Um, and right, in, right before this, the end of chapter 39, it's not comforting at all. Uh, Isaiah tells the king, your sons are going to be taken away um, to Babylon. And so um, the context of it is not comforting at all, that they're, go they're going to be uh, conquered by Babylonians and then taken into exile. Um, and yet, God still brings this word of comfort to them, saying that I, I will restore you. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, at, at this time, it's not, it's not going to be pleasant um, because of the way the people have turned their backs from God. Um, but, but for us today, as we hear it, uh, as we hear these words, um, it should bring comfort to us, uh, for we look especially this time of year, as we look forward to celebrating the first coming of our Lord uh, and, and also ultimately the, his second coming, um, we can have comfort in that. Yeah, how privileged are we, and I say this often on this podcast, that we are on this side of the full gospel story where we have it, we have Old Testament and New Testament, and it's all laid out, and the Messiah has come, and we know the Messiah is coming back, and we're just in that waiting period for his return doesn't mean we don't still have hardship and difficulty in our own wilderness walking and our own exile and all these other things. But yet, I look back to these Old Testament people, and, and they had the promises of stuff, but so much had yet to be played out for them. Whereas we sit on this privileged side of, of history and time, knowing Christ is born, Christ is you know, crucified, risen, and his promise to come back, and we're just waiting for his return. Tom, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I always like to look between the lines kind of thing, okay. see what's there. And <clears throat> what stands out to me is, once again, it says, shout and do not be afraid. 
Mm. So fear not, fear not is the is the theme of the Bible. Yeah, you know, your Lord's coming. He, he's bringing uh, a powerful arm, and he's bringing a great reward. Mm-hmm. So don't be afraid. This all those that need to be afraid are the ones that really need to hear this. It, it's not us right here talking yeah. about it. It's it's those that, that aren't talking about it that need to be talking about it. Yeah, I like that you raised that. I would have... Where, where Where is that shout? It's here somewhere. Shout. I, 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 I glossed right over that, but I like that you, you brought that up because you think about these people in the context of which they were. Mm-hmm. They're about to go into something awful, the exile, the, the you know, you know, the reign and rule of, of other people. And, and yet there's this cry to be, to shout the name of the Lord, to stand fast in the faith, because even though their physical surroundings are changing and they're going to be difficult, God is still with them. God is still present. And God's promises he's made are still completely valid. So there's still that, even in defeat, worldly defeat, there's still this, this battle cry of shout that, you know, praise the name of, of God, Proclaim Christ crucified and risen because that stuff doesn't get impeded or get uh, dissolved by the outcomes of the world. So there's, th- there's still that hope for these people. Yeah, I love that phrase, lift up your voice with strength. Mm. That is a great verse uh, 9. Mm-hmm. What a great way, way to put it. In whose strength? Let's go super biblical here. Let's go super doctrinal here. The strength of the spirit, right? Because you could you could have someone go, "Oh, I'm I'm just I'm meek, I'm quiet." I'm, and it's like, yeah, but the Holy Spirit dwells within you and gives you that strength to 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 proclaim the name of God. And 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 sometimes it's literally shout, and sometimes it's spiritually shouting within our own being about mm. in, in the face of adversity about my, my God lives, my give God you, is steadfast. Give yourself a shout. Yeah, wake yeah. yourself up a little bit. Yeah, from inside, and we see the inter the intertwining of scripture. And, and anybody know when Isaiah was written? That's a super uh, pop, pop quiz. About six to seven hundred years before Christ. Okay, so six to seven hundred years before Christ was born. So let's say six hundred, right? And then let's add another thirty on there. So this was prophesying, you know, three to five here. This. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And this is pointing to John the Baptist and the, and the good work he was going to do. And, and I love where you can see these absolute connections between Old and New Testament. And there's just this, it's this ongoing story from Genesis all the way through Revelation. Sometimes it's not obvious. We have to dig deeper. But there's comfort in that, in the consistency across the literally That's thousands. The spirit. right? The Spirit's there in the Old right. Testament. He's, here's, he's here in the New Testament. He's here with us today. And it shows a common author. <clears throat> Even though God mm-hmm. used these people, God is the author. He's just using these, these, these faithful servants to put the pen to paper, or, or what, quill to paper? What was it, charcoal to paper? Animal's blood? I don't well, know what they're writing with back there. It probably wasn't pap- even paper. <laughs> it wasn't even papers, uh, animal skins or something. I don't know, rock. Mm-hmm. Papyrus. Yes, yeah. That's the yeah, there you go. <clears throat> so there's, a, there's definitely a, a feeling of, it's appropriate they put this in Advent because you have this feeling of this anticipation. And, and like you said, Peter, we can read this on this side of the fence or the timeline and, and, and see joy and see excitement. Uh, go up on the high mountain of Zion, herald of good news, lift up your voice with strength. There's this, this Christ is born, this proclamation of Christ is, is crucified, risen. He's ascended into heaven like the creed we speak every Sunday. There's this we get to speak it with this joy, especially the, the, the point in our service where we get to speak it, right? Our worship service, we speak it after our confession. We've confessed our sins and the forgiveness has been proclaimed and we've been made new and we're, so we're rejoicing. Um, the feast, you know, this is the feast in the early service. As much as that song gets old, I didn't say that, but it gets old. It's a beautiful proclamation of, all right, praise God. Proclaim God, we're redeemed, we're restored, and we're promised eternal life. Speaking of feast, uh, verse 11 says, He will feed his flock like a shepherd, and he'll carry the lambs in his arms and, and hold them close to his heart. Mm-hmm. Love that. And he will gently lead the mother sheep with their young. That's, that's the church. Yeah. That's the bride. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of tenderness in that that verse eleven there, and and the way it, I I love the connections of sheep and shepherd throughout the 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 Bible, and it's that caretaker, and and the sheep are hopeless without the shepherd. They're just gonna wander off and, and get killed. Oh yeah, the, the gnarling teeth of the the predator is always mm-hmm. lurking mm-hmm. lurking at the door. And it's interesting in this part in the verses seven and eight where. It, it kind of gets, is it a little Ecclesiastes in here, ecclesiastical, where yes. it talks about all flesh is grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. So quickly. So quickly we're snuffed out. Right, and we, we live this world and we go about our task and we, we do what we do, and, but we forget how temporary we are. Right. And then this thing hits in verse 8 like a, like, a, like a bomb, a good bomb. The word of our God will stand forever. And someone would say, okay, great, I'm going to die. The word of God said, but what's the word of God? The word of God says, I have eternal life. The word of God says, I'm forgiven. The word of God says, I'm going to live forever in the presence of God. Amen. So, like, bang the heck out of that drum. That's, that's where we, we sink our feet into that foundation. Yep. Bang it louder. Bang it and bang it louder. Right, right. You, you think you're through banging it? Bang it some more. Especially when adversity comes. When Especially. something hits, when you get into exile, when you go into to your own little Babylon or wilderness wanderings or whatever it may be, God's word is still there. It's still, it's, the promises are still there. Get sick, they're still there. Lose your job, they're still there. Mm-hmm. Everyone abandoned you, they're still there. God's word is still there. Speaking of sick... <clears throat> I think we're all kind of getting over a cough or <laughs> something, but and the Lord, the Lord's word is 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 there for for, for our medicine, mm-hmm. for our medicine. Mm-hmm. And he he hasn't promised to heal us here. He may still do it graciously, heal us here, but he's promised us a day is coming when you know that that every November cold, head cold, yeah. poof, mm-hmm. gone away. Mm-hmm. Makes you appreciate it when you're not sick. <laughs> yes. Or when you, have, when you have the lights are on. I always think about that. I'm grateful when the lights are on. Because mm. when they're off, it's what I miss off. them. And that's something right. I think, man, I need to thank yeah. God every day for the simple things like the lights are on. And, and it gives you some peace. Like heat's coming out of the vent. Right. Sometimes that don't happen. <laughs> oh, exactly. Yeah, when it's freezing. Exactly. Yes. All right, let's go ahead and do our next reading. This is Second Peter chapter 3. There's a second Peter? Yeah, I yes. thought you were the only Peter. This is my second this favorite book. This is your second, your second favorite book. Okay. <laughs> the, the Peter Apostle, Peter Burrow, his second book. Chapter 3, verses 8 through 14. And this one's going to talk about time. A lot of time talking here, but it ties good back, to, or well back to our Old Testament thing that was saying, prepare the way of the Lord. Add a little time element too. So here's what it says. Second Peter 3. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, What sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Waiting for the hastening, the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Okay, so you can, as I'm reading through this, you can see that connection back to the Old Testament text in terms of time, but also the temporary nature, where Isaiah was saying, like, the human, humans are like grass, and what are they to God? And just poof, we see here that everything in this, in this earth we live in now is, is temporary. But, there's a, but, but then you transition very quickly into what, what are we hoping for then? You have a new earth. Tom, what are your initial thoughts on this one? Well, at the end it says, So dear friends, while you're waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives 
that are pure and blameless in His sight. Easy to say, but hard to do. Yeah, and we think about, someone will go, why? Why do we, other than the fact that God put these words to the paper and said to do it, but mm-hmm. like, what's the harm if I'm not living, abiding in the Lord? Because He's coming at the moment you least expect it. Yes. That means it's probably in, a, in an area of your life that, that is lacking. It's when He's going to show up. So you need, we need to fix those areas and try to be ready in those areas, especially the areas that we're weak in. Yeah, because in, in, in reality, if unrepentant sin in my life lives like a cancer there, and eventually it starts eating, and then it grows and it grows, and then more unrepented sin comes in there, and then eventually the great risk is that I get to a point where I say, Jesus, who's Jesus? Why do I care about this Jesus thing? I don't need saving from anything. This was a fairy tale someone taught me when I was a little kid. I'm an adult now. I'm grown up. I know better. And that can affect those around you also. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so there's that, that, that reality that we live in this broken, sinful world, and if we live apart from God, we're not saying we're works righteousness, but if we live apart from God, the world is going to pull us into darkness. The devil is going to pull us into darkness, period. Something's always going to be pulling us. The spirit is either pulling us towards God or the world's either pulling us towards sin. Can't, we, we can't just fence ride. There's always something influencing us. So, Peter, what are your thoughts? The Apostle Peter. Oh, well, since I did author this. Yes. Uh, what, you didn't have to read it, right? I mean, you gotta... <laughs> well, the one phrase that really sticks out to me in um, verse 9 is um, that he is patient towards you. Uh, and again, we can think back to the Old Testament and how many times did the people continue to turn their backs and the Lord continued to graciously um, be patient with them? And uh, same thing in our own lives. Uh, all of us can look, at, look and see how patient God is with us. Mm-hmm. Um, and thanks, <laughs> thanks be to God, He is, because um, we need that and we will continue to turn from Him um, Yet he is patient, and he, he continues to give his promises to us. Um, that's, I mean, that, that, that's just another thing that really, really sticks out to me, um, is his patience towards us. And his delay, in this text, Peter's talking about the, the coming of Christ, the last day, his return. His delay is on account of love. He says that's his right. delay is because he wants, he wants more, more to repent and turn back to him. And, so, and someone could stop there and say, but that all should reach repentance, stop. Well, gosh, why, why do I want it? Well, because what comes after repentance? God doesn't just bring us to repentance and go, that's terrible, you shouldn't have done that, and then walk away. God then goes, all right, I forgive you, and restores us and redeems us and claims us. And that's the, repentance can, growing up, repentance to me was a very ugly word. Grew up in the Catholic Church, it was a scary thing. You went to, before the, past, uh, the priest, I went one time, <laughs> It had a very negative feel to it. Mm. You're admitting fault. I never quite grasped what came after it. That would that should make me want to go in repentance every single day. What comes after it is the restoration, restoration, and, and the forgiveness, and the rebuilding, the mercy. redeeming, the mercy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I love I love this verse because it. I can't tell you the number of people that I talk to that talk about how their kids have wandered away. Or they have family members that don't believe. And it, you can see the pain on them. You can see the heartache on them. And I always think back to this. Well, they're not disciples yet. God is patient. Lord God, change their hearts. Make them disciples before you return because you are a patient, loving God. Thank God he is. Yes. So then, but the sound like you said, as, as, and I think it was a connection you also made on the last one, was while we wait, we live diligently in the faith. so that. We don't wander away. And also, we set an example for the people around us. You said how those much it, around us. Yeah, yes. how much we influence those around us when right. they look at us. Do they see Christ or do they see broken, sinful Mark man? Right. What are the thoughts on this? <clears throat> be patient and be expectant, ready for his coming. Mm-hmm. I like that expectancy. I think, um, <laughs> you know, the phone app. On the Apple phone, they find my phone, you know, where you can track someone's movements. 
And my wife will be like, all right, I'm leaving in 20 minutes. I'll be at home. And I'll check that app. And then I'll check that app. And then I'll check that app. To the point that I get car sick checking the app, waiting for her. Is she actually going to leave? Where is she now? Yes. Like, and it's, it's interesting how eager we are on certain things in life. But how we, I think our eagerness or our expectancy and our urgency kind of, it's not quite as bright when it comes to expecting Christ. I think we can, we can be super eager. When's that package showing up? Over eager. Over eager. Yeah. Or like, when, when's a doctor calling? We give so much attention to those things, but we don't give attention to the important things. The anticipation. Important. Yeah. So I think there's something to be learned from this text about applying similar urgencies of everyday life to the expectancy of Christ. Amen. But yeah. it's hard. And I think we've said this before, too, about, yeah, especially as it relates to um, sharing, our, sharing the faith with other people that, oh, I've got, I can do that another day, or, I, you know, oh, I'll run into him again sometime. I can sure. say something then. Sure. Well, what if that day never comes? Yeah. And so I think, yeah, that, that key word there is urge, the urgency of here and now. Yeah. Sharing that gospel message. Carpe diem. Carpe diem, yeah. Seize, Seize the, day the day for the Lord. That always makes me think of Dead Poet Society. <laughs> Carpe diem, <laughs> such a great movie. Um, but but uh, there's, also, there's also the beauty that when we do share the faith, the, the true reality that we are just planting seeds. I love that phrase because to me it takes the pressure off. It takes the fear off. Yeah. I don't have to convert that person right there. Plus, it's not even my job to convert them. It's the spirit. But we just plant seeds. Show up. And then we show up and we let God do what, what God it's promised to do his word will not return void. And it's all in his timing as well. Um, but this, this is one of those things talks about the last day and the world burning up and, and the thing, the new earth, having a new earth. And someone would go, and it, it, all, it, all, it, all, it all centers on, well, how do you know? Well, because every word in here we believe by faith is completely true. That's as far as I can take you. Because if it's not, what are we even doing here? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so so that that's as far as I can take people. Like, well, prove it to me. Well, I can't. Hmm. When's he coming back? I don't know. He but, said soon. But but many promises in here have exactly have been proven. Right. So right. we we have that. Yeah, and there's there's validity that you can go through the, these pages and it says God made this promise and He carried it through. God made this promise and He did it. God said He's doing that and He did it. And there's all these examples here in the Bible of proof that God is trustworthy. Right. Right there. He's so. not going to stop fulfilling those promises now. Yeah. If anything, he's going to be even more diligent in fulfilling them for us. Sure. And it's, it's <clears throat> our ability to hold to a promise wanes over time. It weakens. God's doesn't. You know, we're, 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 we're older men every day. Less hair every day. Less wit every day. God's not like that. That the time doesn't erode God and erode his yeah. abilities. Wait, I have more hair in my ears, <laughs> yeah. my nose. Young men out there, guess what you get to look forward to? Hairy ears yes, when you get hairy old. noses right. and hairy ears. <laughs> less hair on the yeah, head, less on more hair on the ears. All right, let's go to our gospel text here. This is Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through Go from eight. Peter to Mark. He right. Is there so, a second Mark? I am oh. like the, uh, I'm the, uh, the 3,000th Mark. Or actually, I'm probably like the... 300,000th. Hmm. 300 million? 300 million. That'd be even better. All right. Mark 1, verses 1 through 8. And this talks about John the Baptist. So this brings forward that text we heard Isaiah prophesying 600 something years prior to this, this moment, or even probably more like 700 years prior to this moment. Anyways, I'm not, a, I'm not a timeline history dude. So we'll get into this. Mark 1, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locust and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. 
All right. Through I almost 11. kept going. I kept oh, going. Oh, isn't it through 11? <laughs> is it through 11? Let's go through 11. No, maybe not. In those days, Jesus can't, came oh, from... Right. Let's just keep going. Okay. From Nazareth, we can because we have the Word of right. God right All here. Right. And we have the Apostle Peter sitting right here. All right, so in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. When he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You're my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. Ah, uh, the dove... The dove, dove makes an appearance. <clears throat> he yes, went so th- out from the ark, and he didn't come back. But now he came back and settled on Jesus. Anytime there's a reference to the dove, look for the Holy Spirit. And there's yes. just this, I don't know, in my mind, there's always this element of peace with the, with the reference of the dove. Mm. There's mm. just this. Which is our theme for this week in Advent. It's peace. It is. Second week two is peace. It is. Even though that may not be part of the text, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. And it's, but what, is, what struck me as I was reading through this, and I didn't think about it earlier, but John was bizarre. Oh, yes. Clothed in camel's hair. I don't know what the leather belt had to do anything. That's pretty normal. Locusts. But ate locusts and wild, and wild honey. honey. So he was outside of the mainstream culture. He lived a weird life. He was preaching a weird message. But he wasn't too unlike the weird savior that was coming into the world. Like you have this, your king came in as a baby born in squalor and that's your God. Like the world looks at that and thinks, what a joke. And they'd probably looked at John and thought, what a joke. What's this guy, this guy preaching, but it's, that's kind of the longstanding reality of how the gospel is a, it's not of this world. Because it, in terms of the secular world, because it's so different. It says all the people of Judea came out to see him. All the people in Jerusalem came out to see this freakish occurrence that's going on. Some, some with good motives, some with, let's see what this weirdo's doing. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yes. yeah, a lot of it was, you know, this is pre-technology days, but it was gawkers. It was ones who were like, I'm going to see what's going on. I'm curious. Then you maybe you had some who wanted to stir things up, and um, right. But it's it's baptism is for for everyone. It's just a matter of mm. are you are you receiving the gift of faith or are you fighting the the gift of faith? Repent, repent, and be baptized. And that's the message for uh, you know, it's part of Advent as we look to the second coming. Um, that message of repentance is so important. Mm-hmm. You know. It, when should I repent? Well, the time is now. <laughs> Continuously? Yeah. yeah. Right. At all times. Always be, be yeah. repentant. Um, because he's coming at a time we don't know. We, no right. we will least expect it. So be repentant in that moment too. Yep. Sure. And, and that ties well with waiting. Well, I'm waiting. How do I fill my time? Prayer sounds like a good idea. Constant prayer. Constant prayer. Constant readiness. Be, be in the Word. Be, be in fellowship with other believers so you can wait together because it's so much easier waiting with them without. Constantly being lifted up by the word. Right. And we have to come back to the word all the time because, like I said in the Old Testament, the world is feeding us a different message. Mm. Sometimes they cross over a little bit, but the world is often feeding us a different message that is counter to the gospel. Yeah. And... If we live under the, like, the world tells me I'm valuable if I go, I'm successful, I'm wealthy, I'm popular, all those things. The Bible tells me God loves me because he created me, redeemed me, and restored me. And I am, I am his, an heir to the kingdom. Not by anything I do, but by his graciousness. And so that I need to keep all the Christians to come back to that truth, to be refed that, because the world is feeding us something different. Amen. That, that just breeds doubt and fear. They have the anti-message. Right. The world has the anti-message, trying to bring us away from Christ. And it's, and it's very, very deceptive because yes. the message from the world makes a lot of sense. It makes logical connections. I can see it. I can feel it. I can touch it. It's tangible. And so in that, I think that's where the devil is his, his most deceptive and sneaky, is when he sneaks in with doubts that, that make a lot of sense mm. to the human brain. Do we want to be smart? And knowledgeable, or do we want to be wise? I'd rather be the dumbest rock on the block 
and have faith in Christ than be the smartest guy in the room and have no idea who Jesus is. That's true wisdom right there. And that's because of what it said in uh, that Second Peter, the world is going to come to an end. And the, the, in the Isaiah text, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. Mm-hmm. What other thoughts come to mind on this one? It's kind of a simple text, but... Yeah, I think John is a, a great example for us, too, because he, I mean, you can just think of it. He, he got the calling. You're, you're going to be the one preparing the way for the Messiah. I mean, you can see how very easy that would be to get, get into his head. Uh, and yet, even in, in verse 7, He's very humble and says, well, no, mm-hmm. it's not me. The one coming after mm-hmm. me is far right. greater. They wanted mm-hmm. to proclaim John as the right. Messiah. Yeah. But he's yeah. like, no, that's not me, but I am pointing the way to him. Right. He will be here soon. And one of my favorite, uh, I guess you'd call it a quote from John the Baptist. It's actually in the Gospel of John. He says, um, I must become less that he might become more. More. And I think that's just a great attitude all of us Talk about a have. counter message to the oh. world. Mm. I must become less? Shame on you. Don't tell me that. Mm. I must become more in all things. Mm. That's, the, that's the tricky message. And this to me, as you were saying that, Peter, this to me is a very, for any disciple, but most importantly for pastors and preachers and priests, like you're, you have a task to proclaim the gospel Make sure you don't get yourself in front of that. Mm-hmm. Make sure you don't elevate yourself and become, uh, you start dimming the light of Christ and, uh, and increasing the light of you know, Mark or, or whoever the, the preacher may be. It's a, very, it's a very important, humbling message there. I keep Christ centered. That means to keep him right in front of you. So everything you see, it, it, it has a, Christ filter mm-hmm. to it. Mm-hmm. Because, praise God, that's how he looks at us as his children, right. that he sees us through the br- blood of his son, because otherwise... And only through the blood of his son. Because otherwise we're... We're toast. We're toast. You know? <laughs> we're toast. We're done. It's, mm-hmm. it's that good reality. And, and, the, and I think, as you're saying that, the connection that came to mind to me there was the way I keep my eyes on Christ is I keep my sin ever before me. Mm-hmm. Because then I'm lead to, led to see how much I need Jesus and I, how much I need to be in repentance um, so that I don't get myself elevated and thinking that somehow it's about me versus being about Jesus. Humility. It's, that's the, be- the beginning of wisdom, being humble. Although I, I often say, Lord, help me to be humble, yes. but don't humble me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want I to don't be humble. Yes. Be, be careful what you ask for. Be careful what you ask for. It's like praying, pr- praying for patience. Yeah. <laughs> Help me just to be patient. Don't make yeah. me have to practice Don't patience. make me learn the hard lesson again. I just want you to supernaturally do it. That's the thing. That's a tricky thing. Mm. It's going to be kind of a tangent, but I'm learning Greek right now. And I think, oh, gosh, if God wanted me to learn Greek, he could just do it. Like, snap his fingers. <laughs> so sometimes I'll be like sheepishly, hey, Lord, I know you can do this. So if you want to do it. That'd be awesome. But otherwise, help me to learn it. Help me to help me to, to get through the assignments. But I know you can do it. Teach me the good way, though. Right. The good way. And you learn by, you know, you, you grow by journeying through it versus God just going. True that. You remember it better. Right. When there's something that you've had to fight through to yeah. get to the other side. Yeah. All right. Any other final thoughts on these texts? All right, folks. Ooh. Fear not. Fear not. And come worship with us this Sunday. It's a special Sunday, too, because we have, in between our early service and our late service, we have the Children's Christmas Program. And this is a big production where the youngest amongst us get to come and preach the gospel to us, to adults. And it's it's so encouraging in the world we're in right now where we see kids. There's so much coming at kids. It's encouraging to see kids of all ages. We have preschool all the way up to high school kids participating in this, proclaiming the truth of Christ. What better foundation to start kids out in the world than proclaiming the truth of Christ when they're kids? You know, the proverb, teach them the way they'll go when they're young and they won't depart from it when they get old. Right. So I've that's missed, our hope. I've missed this once before. I came in at the last of it, and it just touched my heart so much. Mm-hmm. I promised I would never miss it again. It's something about little kids hearing little yes, kids. It, yes. it just it, it hits differently. Yep. Right. So join us. That'll be at 945. We'll have our normal services. No Sunday school, but we'll have that time in, in the sanctuary. So come on, join us here at uh, Oso McKinney. We'll Absolutely. catch you all on the next Sunday preview.